There you go. All our kids going to Children's Church. Let's give our Children's Church workers a hand. They do a great job for us. Appreciate them so much. You got the PowerPoint up, please? We're going high tech this morning. You need to, yeah, you need to put it on the slideshow. It's up at the top, it says slideshow, and then you need to hit from the beginning. There we go. Everybody turn around. Richard, you see that TV right there? That's taking us into the 21st century. We're going to do a lot of things with that. And you know who bought that? The ladies' ministry of the church. Let's give the ladies' ministry, the women's ministry, a big hand for buying that for us. Now, I'm not going to say how old collectively that group is, but it's, it's, th these are the older women of our church. I mean, these are... These are the women who've uh, been in this church a long time and seen a lot of things come and go. And isn't it great that they had the forethought and the, the vision to realize that we need to, we need to get into some technology. So let's give them a hand for their forethought. We appreciate the ladies of the church doing that for us. Amen? Amen. We're continuing our series, if you'll open your Bibles, to Matthew chapter 3. And then you can go to chapter 5, too. I hope you understand how, how, how great God is and how he moves and how he works all things together. Amen? We are, we are in a moment. We are in a moment. Uh, you lost me all of a sudden. We are in a moment where God is about to do some great things Amen. in this community. Yes. Amen? Amen. Yes. We, are in a, we are in a strategic moment, and if we let this strategic moment pass us by, God may, be, God may be faithful and bring us another one, but we need to take advantage of the strategic moments that God has given us. Amen? Amen. Yes. There's some great things happening. Today, I hope you'll all show up for the Pinewood Derby. Now you say, what's the Pinewood Derby got to do with church? You know, we're going to have people coming on this property tonight that don't normally go to church just to race their car. Isn't that good? Amen. Everybody say amen. amen. And it's great when we can all get together and we can fellowship and we can do different things. Last weekend we did the Art of Marriage. We're still getting a lot of positive feedback from that. How many marriages are still going strong? Let me see all those hands out there. Amen. Praise God. Yes. Can you share about what happened to us? Sure. Yeah. There you go. Um, we had something really exciting happen to us this week. And Amen. That goes along with the art of marriage, but it also goes along with the Pinewood Derby that you just don't know who you're ministering to and how you're ministering to them. We were getting the rental truck at, uh, at budget and we were just standing there and we were talking and we were having a conversation um, about um, where to get gas in the truck because we want to try to get it to the cheapest place that we can. Of course, we, Amen. we know that's Virginia and South Carolina and not North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so we were talking that thing through and Don was a little confused about how we were going to go because we we're used to going from Hampton and I kept saying, well, we're not going that way. And so we were talking and um, so we just had that conversation and he says, oh yeah, you're, you're right, you're right. I'm, I'm going from the wrong direction, whatever. And he left to go get the truck. And the gentleman behind us who was waiting said, well, you two must not be married. You must be dating. Because nobody is that nice to each other when they're having a disagreement. And I said, and I was just, that was just the Lord because then I was able to share with him. I said, well, that's because the Lord is the number one in our lives. Amen. And that's what we, what we, uh, that's how we are able to do what we're able to do. And he says, well, I'm glad my wife wasn't here to hear this because... <laughs> 
<coughs> to which we should have replied to say, well, you know, I hope your wife is here, <laughs> you know, the next time you do it. Yeah. We also are doing a devotion called the um, Love Dare devotional. It's an excellent devotional. And that morning, <coughs> our devotional had been on kindness and being kind to one another and speaking kindly. And I know that that had an influence on how we interacted that day, especially on Don. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So I just want to encourage you that you just never know. Yes. You never know when you're ministering to someone and when God's going to give you an opportunity to say, you know, the Lord is what makes the difference in our lives. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. Yes. And just think what would have happened if we would have gotten, if, well, Crystal wouldn't have got, but I would have argued with her. Amen? Yeah. Uh, what a witness that would have been. We'd have had no witness. Amen? So God is good. It works when you work it. Amen? That's right. And we're going to talk about working it today. Amen. We're going to talk about what it takes to get us to this place that we need to go. There's a revival taking place starting next Sunday night at Calvary Pentecostal Holiness Church. How many know Gustavo Torres? He's our uh, youth leader for our conference. He's going to be leading the worship. And so that's next Sunday night. So we won't have Sunday night service here next Sunday night. I want you all to go over to Calvary and we'll join with Pastor Joe and his congregation. Amen. And they'll be having uh, meetings during the week also. And then coming up, there's a big tent revival down at the, the beach. What's the name of the beach? Arrowhead, Arrowhead Beach. Uh, a lot of pastors in the area. That's in April. Just a lot of great things going on. Amen? Amen. And uh, so, so w w we're at a strategic place. God is trying to get this community and this church to be a part of something that Crystal was prophesying over that we've seen coming. I've seen it since I've been here. There is just a lot of hurting people in our community. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so this series that we're talking about, the Sermon on the Mount, how to have an impact on the secular culture is coming from Matthew chapter 5, and I want to read it. I know you're, you're probably, I, I hope this is getting into your heart and into your soul. Amen? Amen. Repetition reinforces retention. You know, a lot of times we get up here as pastors and we can just preach 100 miles an hour and we can cover uh, volumes of material. But uh, if you don't get this, this is, the, this is foundation. Once we get this as a church, we're ready to build. Amen? Amen. So, Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 3, is talking about, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name and my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together as the people of God. Lord, we thank you that we've worshipped you with song today. We've worshipped you with our offerings. We've worshipped you by lifting up prayers to you. And now we can continue to worship you with our attention and our focus on your word. O oh, Holy Spirit, come. You have free reign to work in our hearts. Counsel us, convict us, and even comfort us. And Lord, we know there's nobody here by accident. They're here for a divine appointment today, Lord. And they're here to hear from you. So, Lord, we bind every spirit that's not of Jesus Christ that's in and around this place. We, divine, we bind every spirit of distraction. We loose, we loose hearing. We loose, uh, uh, we loose the ability to understand. We loose the ability to just comprehend and take this into our spirit and into our soul and into our bodies. So, Lord, I just rejoice with all that you're doing in this church and all that you're doing in this community. I rejoice over everyone that's here today, Lord God. And we thank you for that. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're talking about nine attitudes that will determine our altitude. Now, we made it very clear that altitude 
Attitude, attitude is about position, right? That's right? It's what position you're in to do something. That's an attitude. Right. You know, if you're not in the right position, you can't do the right thing. Now, I, I'm a sports fan, and right now we're, in the ball, we're involved in baseball spring training. How many know that? How many baseball fans I got here? Amen? And we, what they're doing in, in the baseball training right now is they're teaching the pitchers to be in the right position to throw the ball. They're teaching the batters to be in the right position to hit the ball. They're teaching the outfielders to be in the right position to catch the ball, and so on and so forth. Everybody, they're talking about position and where you need to receive to get to, get to, to be the most successful. So we're going to get into position to be the most successful by understanding what these blessed positions are. Amen? And what's really interesting is they're not what we think they would. You know, we would think if you want to be in the right position to, to, to get successful, you, you, need to, you need to think positive. Amen? You need to have all this, this, this high and lofty stuff. But the Bible twists everything around. Amen? The Bible inverts everything. And the Bible, the Bible kind of says in order to get what you need, you got to start from the bottom. Amen? And you got to empty yourself out to be filled up. And then once we get in the right position, we can achieve an altitude. Now, an altitude is about position of where you are, where, where you've come from and where you're going. And altitude is about elevation for provision. Amen? God wants to take us from a certain position to a certain place, and at that place, he's going to be able to provide for us. If we don't, if we're not in the right position, we can't get to the right place, and God can't give us what he wants. Amen? So that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about how that if we get to this place, that we're going to be able to show people what a Christian really looks like. We're going to be able to show the world around us that it works. Amen? Amen? There's the people out there in the world need to see something that works. Amen. They don't need to hear that it works. They need to see that it works. They need to see people who are not only talking the talk, but walking the talk as well. So that's our goal right here. Now it all started off with Jesus. Oh, I've got to turn it on. We'll work at the bugs out here as we go along on this thing. It all started out with Jesus declaring a separation. Now, remember we talked about this. If you want to look in your Bibles, I've also got it up on the screen for you. Matthew 5, 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, this is a separation here. This is a pursuing Jesus. You're not going to be able to get into this position, into these out attitudes, until you do a separation. There was the multitude, everybody down here. Jesus kind of turned his back. I can just imagine everybody's talking about the football game and about, well, you know, whatever's going on in life. They're talking about where they ate dinner last night. They're talking about how their children don't obey them. Somebody say amen. They're talking about how their, you know, their, their wife and their husband don't do what they say. And all of a sudden, Jesus kind of just turns around and starts walking up the mountain. And uh, I get this picture that, that not everybody sees him leave because they're too busy talking about their own stuff. But all of a sudden, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Matthew, and all of a sudden they look around, and Jesus isn't there. Where is he? And they see him walking up the mountain. Guess what? They begin to follow him. And, and pretty soon, people begin to separate. There's a group still talking about all the stuff of life, still talking about all their things. And there's a group of people saying, hey, wait, wait, Jesus. Hang on. Hang on. Wait, Jesus. And then they all get there, and once they get there, Jesus has them sit down, and Jesus starts to teach them. So we need to be separate. We need, we need to be focused Amen. on Jesus, and then he can teach us. Amen? Amen. We, nobody on that mountain, when they were, Jesus was teaching them, kept running back to the crowd to see what they were talking about. Oh, yeah, okay, I got that. Okay, let me go back up here. They, they, they would have never got what Jesus wanted to get them. Right. They were sitting, and they were focused. Philip Yancey wrote a book called What Good Is God? If you, ever, if you want to read a good author, Philip Yancey, anything he writes is great. But his latest book is called What Good Is God? He talks about several subjects. And one of the things Philip is involved in is the underground church in China. He goes over there frequently. He's, 
He's been almost jailed several times, and he meets with leaders. And Dr. Pratt's another one. He wrote, the, he wrote the book Radical. If you want to find, they both are connected to the underground church in China, and they're doing some great work there. But he tells the story in his book that he was in a meeting. Now, now they don't meet in nice buildings like this, amen? They meet in rooms like our Sunday school rooms. And they mean, they, they, they're, they're packed like this. There's so many people in the room that, you know, if, uh, if this person up here has to go to the bathroom, five people have to get up and get out of his way. Amen. And he says they were in a room like that one night. And all of a sudden the door bust open and there's two men dressed as Chinese soldiers with guns in their hand. And they, they raised the guns up and they said, look, everybody who's a Christian Stay in this room. If you're not a Christian, get out. And he said, four, five, six, maybe eight, ten people left the room. And everybody is just kind of nervous of what's going to happen. Are they going to be put in jail? Are they going to, are they going to be uh, taken away to prison? And so the, the two guards put their guns down and say, okay, now that the real Christians are here, let's get started. <laughs> See, they can't take a chance over there. But those people that stayed behind... They were willing to, whatever, whatever was going to happen to them was going to happen to them because they were Christians. Yeah. See, there's a separation. Amen. See, in order for us to, to have an impact in our community, in order for us to have an impact with the people that are around us, there's got to be a separation. That's right. We can't be the same as them. That's right. We can't talk the same as them. We, we can't, we can't, you, you know, we, we, there's got to be something different about you. Amen? Amen. Here's the problem. How many know the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Yeah. There's a picture of it up there. It's leaning. Yeah. Yeah. It's been leaning for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Matter of fact, when they built it, as soon as they started building, they built the first floor, it began leaning because it was built on an inadequate foundation. The ground was too soft to support the weight on one side. But they kept on building it. And the more they built it, the more it started to lean. Amen. And so the foundation was bad, and the angle was bad. See, some of us, we want to do these great things for God. See, we want to be all the way up on that top floor, raising the dead, amen, and, and doing all the great, but, but, but our foundation is not good, and so we're tilted. And so the world, you know, the world sees us praying for the, to heal the sick, but when they look at our lives, they're saying, now, wait a minute, he's, he's, he's claiming all this stuff, or she's claiming all this stuff, but when I look at their lives, it, it, it doesn't make sense. They go tilt. Amen? See, the Leaning Tower of Pisa was built on a bad foundation. And instead of stopping and fixing the problem, they kept on building. We need to lay a good foundation. Amen. This church needs to lay a good foundation. We're in the process of that. We, you got a new pastor coming, maybe. Amen? Yeah. We got a new shepherd coming who's going to shepherd this flock with knowledge and understanding and we need a foundation for that shepherd to build upon amen we need a foundation to reach the lost of our community and to help all these hurting people amen yes. so today is 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 foundation day amen we are going to shore up our foundation so when we get ready to move into these next six attitudes to get our altitude we'll be on a solid foundation amen yes. So that's what today is all about. Now we have, we have three foundational things we, we need to look at. And um, uh, one of the things about a uh, building is, you know, buildings draw people. Amen? Right. Buildings draw people. You remember Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all people unto me. Right. Now I was in the, let me know, I was in the Navy. And I went to Denmark. How many of you have ever been to Denmark? Great food. Great, great cheese and dairy products, but they got tons of castles. Everywhere you go, there's a castle. You go on a castle tour, you don't see one castle, you don't see two castles, you see like 15, 20 castles. You see, back then, during that medieval time, if you didn't have a castle, you weren't anybody. That's right. I mean, if you wanted to be somebody, you got to build a castle, Amen. You got to have a, an edifice for people to come look at. And as you can see, each of those castles is a little more intricate than the next. And, you know, it was designed to show people, you know, that, what, what they were all about. Hey, this is what we're all about. We, we're building a castle because what were castles for? Back then, when the enemies would come, where would everybody go? Yeah. They run to the castle and shut the gate and say, protect us. We're safe. Amen. 
So we need to be those kind of buildings. We need to be the building. We need to be disciples who are being built up into castles, if you will, so that when people see the trouble coming, they'll run to us. Amen. See, Christian is more by attraction than promotion. Amen. Because words are hollow. They hear, the people around us hear tons of words every day. They hear people on the news say how great they are. You know, they hear our politicians say they're going to, you know, uh, uh, they're going to give them everything, a car in every garage and a chicken in every pot. That's an old, uh, uh, that's an old campaign slogan from back in the early 20s, 1920s. One guy ran for president and said, I'm going to give everybody a car in every garage and a chicken in every pot. And that's everybody, you know, voted for him because everybody wants their needs met. Amen. But you know what? We have, more, we have something better than material needs. We have eternal needs that, that God can make. So we want to be built up for that. So the first foundation we need to lay here is Matthew 5, 3. And we talked about that. And the, the scripture is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So here's what happens. We have the poor, we get poor in spirit. Remember, in order to get to where we need to go, we need to realize where we're at. You got to realize how poor you are in spirit, how downright bankrupt you are. Amen. Right. You see, the world doesn't doesn't do that because they, they they are taught in through all the humanistic teaching that there's something there's something good in each person. There, there's something that, that that can be built upon in each person, but the Bible doesn't teach that. The, what the Bible says is we're all sinners. Amen. We're all sinners. All of us, none of us can do right. Even when we think we're doing right, we're doing it for the wrong motives. Amen? Amen. You see, we're all sinners. Only, only, only God can protect that chain. We have to come to God as bankrupt. That's right. I got nothing, God. That's right. I got nothing to give you. Amen. All I got is, is, is my will right now, and I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to give that to you. Amen. So we're poor in spirit. And then what happens? We get a new spirit. We get a new spirit, which is fanned into flame by the Holy Spirit. I really like this illustration God gave me the other day when I was over in the kitchen with Miss Tammy. I couldn't get the, the, the stove to work, and if it was because it's a gas stove, and uh, you got to light the pilot light. You see, the gas was on. Yeah. That's our spirit, our little S spirit in the Bible, in the New King James. Every time you see a little S, it talks about either the spirit of man or the spirit of the world. It doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit. Only here, the Holy Spirit has a big S. But we, I couldn't get it to light, but, but the gas was going. Yeah. See, that's our spirit. But what happens when the Holy Spirit comes? Tammy took a, a match or a lighter and stuck it in there, and guess what? Boom! We had a flame. And you know what? I could cook something. Amen? Amen. If I had put my chicken in there without the flame, we'd have raw chicken. Amen? But we had a hot oven. We could cook chicken and we could cook potatoes. Do anything we want. That's what happens to us. The, the new spirit that we get is flanned into flame by the Holy Spirit. And then we have the provision of the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Now, that we're going to talk about that. The new spirit of the kingdom of heaven. But look, here's the scripture. Ezekiel chapter 11, 19 and 20. Then I will give them one heart. And when I put a new spirit. See, that's a little less. It's going to take that old bankrupt spirit you got and it's going to give you a new spirit that the Holy Spirit can work with. I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they, will, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. How is this possible? Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. See, secular humanism te teaches I can, I can be fixed. I just got to get enough intelligence. I just got to get enough of this stuff. I just got to learn this. I just got to do that. I got to take this. I got to participate in that. But see, the problem is, is you're, you're building upon a soft foundation. And pretty soon you'll be like the lean tower of Pisa. You'll be all tilted over. God says, I'm going to take away all the old foundation. I'm going to take away all the soft stuff. I'm going to put in a new heart. I'm going to put in a new spirit. And then that's where we start building. That's where we start going. Amen. How many have seen this picture? This is a picture of an operation that was being formed on a baby in the womb of its mother. And during the operation, they had to cut 
the womb open of the mother. And while the doctor was operating, a little hand, you see the little hand right there, I hope you can see it. There's a little hand that sticks out right there. And the, and the, and the doctor, it grabbed the doctor's finger. If there's ever a, a slide that takes away the stupid argument that it's not a baby, this is one of them. See, that's us. We're just babies. See, we, we, we have nothing. A little baby in a womb has nothing. And that little baby is reaching out for the hand of the doctor that's saving its life. Amen. See, we need to do that. Indeed. We need to realize that we're just babies. And, and without help, we're, 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 we're actually dead. We need, we need help to live. And that Amen. doctor is going to give that baby life. And that's us. That's where we start. That's where we start. And then we begin... To, 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 to work from there. Jesus said this. Healthy people don't need a doctor. The sick people do. That's right. See, today, you got you to lay it all out. You got to say, God, I need you. I, I need you every minute of every day. I don't just need you on Sunday mornings. Amen? Amen. I just don't need you on Wednesday nights. I mean, I was, God, God was, when I was out in the world doing my own thing, God was my rescuer. I didn't need God until I got in trouble. Yeah. Help! Yeah. You know, and you know what? God was great. God showed up many times in my life. And of course, as soon as I got out of the trouble, as soon as things started going good, guess where God was? He's like a spare tire. I put him back in the trunk of my car. Amen? When I had a flat tire, I pulled him out, put him on my car. But when I, when I got, uh, got somewhere and got a new tire, I put him back in the trunk. See, we've got to have that desperation. That's the foundation upon which we need to build. That's the foundation on which we need to go. This attitude I talked about leads to a new spirit which elevates us to a place where we get the provision of the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Now, the kingdom of heaven is the same thing as the kingdom of God. And, you know, Jesus talks more about the, this aspect of his ministry than, than anything. And we don't hear a lot preached on it. But I gave a couple weeks ago, I gave you some scriptures that, about the the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But here's just a couple. This is Matthew chapter 13, 14, and 16. Again, the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. You see, when you realize you're poor in spirit, and you get the new spirit, you get the Holy Spirit, you have access to an unlimited supply yes. of stuff. I mean, you have access to everything you need. Now, I don't mind praying for people. I love praying for people. But sometimes people come to me and want me to pray for stuff they already got. I need, I, need more, I need more of God in my life. God is in your life. If you don't have more of God, it's not God's fault. You need to throw some stuff and clean some stuff out. So maybe God's stuck, stuck in the back room somewhere. Get him out of the closet. Amen. You know, some people says, I, you know, I, I, I want to be more disciplined. You've got everything it needs in your life to be more disciplined. You've got the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. You've got, you got the power of the Word. You've got the Word of God right here. You've got people praying for you. Yeah. See, sometimes we already got what we need, but we're not accessing it. You have, you know, there was a couple. And they got married. They went on a honeymoon. And the husband, the husband thought he would do a great thing. And he, would, he got this special suite, the honeymoon suite in one of the best hotels in, in Orlando. And they were going to go down there, and they were going to go to Disney World. They had a great time. And so, you know, he says, oh, honey, you're really going to love this. It's a wonderful suite and everything like that. Well, the plane got delayed, and they got, got in late at night. And they kind of were tired, and they checked in. And the guy gave them a set of keys, and they, they, they walked in, and they saw the room, and they, they opened the room. They opened All there was in the room was a bed. And it wasn't even a, a king-side bed. It was a twin bed. And there was a bathroom, and there was a dresser and a little closet. And they, they were just, the husband goes, ah, oh, this is terrible, honey. I'm really sorry. And she says, oh, I'm sorry. Don't worry about it now. So they went ahead and went to bed, got up the next morning. First thing the husband does, go down to the lobby and says, hey, man, I paid a lot of money for this room. It's supposed to be the best room you got. And all I got is a little twin bed and a little bathroom and, and a little, you know, where's, where's, I mean, I paid for the best. And the, uh, the guy at the counter says, well, let me see your keys. And he looked at his keys and said, sir, there's two keys on here. 
The first key that you used is to the butler's suite. The next key is to your suite. <laughs> you see, some of us are living in the butler's suite, yeah. but we got the key to the big suite. Yeah. So, so he went back and, of course, and had a huge suite with a, uh, you know, a, 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 a big bathroom with a, a pool, with a sauna in it and everything. It was just wonderful. But see, some of us, Satan, Satan keeps us bound by not knowing what, our, what we have at our disposal. You have the power of the universe at your disposal. That's what this is all about. That's what this foundation, foundation, he goes on to say, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went out and sold all that he had and bought it. Being the subjects of the kingdom brings the blessing and advantages of all kinds of blessings that flow from the king. I'm a history buff, and I just got done reading a book. If you, if you, if you, if you like history, uh, Bill O'Reilly's written a book called Killing Lincoln, and they've turned it into a mini-series. I think it's on, on the uh, History Channel. Um, and uh, Lincoln's a very interesting fellow, but there's a story that's told about his son. One day, there was a man during the Civil War, uh, and a Abraham Lincoln had issued an order that no, nobody was allowed to leave the battlefield. Everybody had to stay. And during the, that time, the order was forced that, that anybody uh, that, that had any kind of problems, it was no matter what happened, you had to stay on the battlefront. Well, this soldier had uh, been stationed in Washington, D.C., and he got a letter that said his wife was dying. And so he, he didn't know what to do. So he began walking around Washington, D.C. He really wasn't to pay attention to where he was going. And he ended up on the lawn of the White House. And uh, he got so discouraged that he, he sat down and he began to cry. Pretty soon, a little boy walked up to him. And a little boy asked him, what's the matter? Well, you know, there's some times when adults need just the sense of a little child. So he turned to the little child and he said, my wife is dying and I wanted to furlough, but they won't allow me and they won't even allow me to come and, and see the president to ask him. The little fellow said, very well, you take my hand and I'll take you in. So he led him up the steps of the White House, this little boy led him up and he passed right past the guards. And with this, little, with this grown soldier in tow, the little boy walked past all the guards that were all in the hallway of the White House right up to the Oval Office. The soldier was amazed. How could this little boy just walk in the White House and do as he pleased? Soon the soldier's questions were answered. As the little boy and the soldier approached the Oval Office, a, this, a secretary stepped out and said, the president is busy, but the little fellow was not put off. Still holding the soldier's hand, the little boy just pushed the door open to the Oval Office and cried out, Father, tell her it's all right for me to come in. Abraham Lincoln dropped his pen and said to his secretary, let him in. I always have time for my son. The boy came in with his newfound friend, and the soldier told his story to his father, Abraham Lincoln, who dipped his pen in the ink and signed the order of furlough for the man to be sent home. <laughs> you see, that's us. We're the little boy. That's right. And we have access to the king. But we let all this stuff stop us, and we should just brush it aside and keep on going. You see, Abba means daddy. That's right. We have a great daddy. Yes. We have a great older brother. We have Jesus. And that Holy Spirit that lives in us, he's, he's, another word for him is the helper. See, God has given us what we need. He's given us what we need to move forward. So that's the first foundational stone. We have the first foundation. And this is, the, this is if we don't get this, we can't get anything else. Because remember, we're made of three sparks. We're made of spirit, yes. we're made of soul, and we're made of body. The spirit, if the spirit isn't right, the soul won't be right and the body will be right. See, because some of us, we don't, we're not letting the Holy Spirit rule our life, so we're ruled by our soul. That's right. And that's the second block that comes in. Building block is our soul. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The second attitude is teaching us that our new spirit, which is now connected with the Holy Spirit, will take control of our soul which is our intellect, our personality, and our emotions. We talked about mourning. Mourning is about crying over loss, about grieving over the loss. The, the, mourning is always most sometime involved in two things. One is death. Something is missing. Something's gone. You know, we, we mourn over a person, a loved one who's passed away. But, you know, people mourn over the loss of time. 
Remember the good old days? You ever hear people say that? Oh, I wish it was like this, or I wish it was like that. They're mourning the loss. Those days are never going to come again. And there's a hole in their life. And unfortunately, some people get stuck in the good old days. Amen? But you know what I found? If you look real close, them good old days weren't really the good old days. Amen? We tend to lose perspective after a while. Amen? You know, I always, who, who wants to go back uh, with no air conditioning? How many want you to live without air conditioning again? Let me see that. But I always, oh, when I grew up, we didn't have any air conditioning. Well, I'm glad I didn't grow up where you were. Amen? Amen. You know, it's okay to do that. It's okay to mourn, but you can't stay there. Some people are stuck in mourn. Some people are still grieving over a loss of, of a loved one three, four, five, six, ten years. When, when it's okay to mourn them, but it's all, you need to get on with your life. Amen. That's, that's, that's what God wants us to do. And then there's the mourning, the crying over the soul when it, it's in great anguish. And great distress over the sin. When our souls get to the place where we, as we just defined, when we're feeling lost, when our souls are in anguish and despair, when our intellect and personality and emotions are in chaos, that's when we receive the provision of the king and his kingdom. You see, what it says there is what? It says that we're going to get comfort from the comforter. Amen. We're going to get comfort from the comforter. Because you know what? This is one of the greatest provision of the kingdom is the Holy Spirit. Greatest provision. John 14, 16, 17. I have it up on the board. This is the King James. I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. This word comforter is from the Greek word parakletos, which is the same word that we use for the Holy Spirit in John. God is saying here that when we mourn, when we are grieving over a loss of something, when there's a hole in our life, we will receive comfort from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Which is from the first foundation we laid because when we realize that we're poor in spirit, we get a new spirit, we're now tapped into the resources of the kingdom of heaven. And what's the greatest resource of the kingdom of heaven? The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. This whole idea of comfort, of serving as a paracletos, David talks about. The Holy Spirit comforts us by serving as the paracletos, which can be translated counselor or one who brings direction. David writes of this type of comfort in Psalm 23, 4. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Amen. You see, sometimes comfort is, all not, is not about just making you feel all happy and clappy. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Sometimes the Holy Spirit comforts us by, by hitting us a little bit, uh, you know, taking us out in the woodshed and putting a two-by-four to the place where we don't understand. Amen? <laughs> see, see, God is about making us the best that we can be, and the Holy Spirit is about doing that. So sometimes comfort is not always just kind of making us get, have this emotional giddy feeling. Comfort is God taking us from a bad place and getting us to go to a good place, and sometimes that causes suffering. Amen? It causes, causes pain. You know, many of you know that I'm an alcoholic and that I had to go through rehab and I had to go through that whole thing. You know, it was the hardest thing in the world to do that. It involved physical suffering. It involved emotional suffering. It involves physical suffering. And you know what? There, the many people didn't make it that were with me on that journey because it, the pain was too great. See, they thought the minute they, 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 they decided they wanted to get their life straight that, that everything would go away. But you know what? You have to go through the suffering sometimes. You have, whatever, you go, whatever you want to change in your life, it requires suffering and change and requires mental to be think differently. And then we get to the place where we have. You know, I wish many a time I had a magic wand. People come into my office and they have all this stuff. Going. Matter of fact, I also have in my drawer in my office, how many know what a slinky is? I, I, I grew up with slinkies. And I'd get a slinky on Christmas, but by New Year's, my slinky was all tangled up. I'd take it to my dad and i said, Dad, could you fix the slinky? And he'd look at it and say, no, man, once a slinky gets tangled up, uh, the only way you can, he said, the only way you can untangle a slinky is one kink at a time. And so I'd sit there for hours untangling that slinky, getting all those kinks out and take me a long time. And, and then eventually the slinky would work at work. See, some people come into to church and they come to Christ and their life is a tangled up slinky. That's right. And they want us to go poof and make it a whole slinky again. 
But see, sometimes God wants you to untangle that slinky. One time, well, God wants you to untangle the things in your life one kink at a time. Yes. Amen. Because you know why? So that when you get that kink out of your life, you can go show somebody else how to get the kink out of their life. And when you get your slinky all clean and all working smooth again, and you see somebody whose life is a tangled slinky, you can show, look, this is my slinky, but you know what? It used to be like your slinky. You see, we need each other. Amen. The whole thing about this Christianity is that it's about you and me working together as the body of Christ. Amen. I need you. You need me. That's what the saddest thing as a pastor is when people are hurting, when people are in conflict, when the people are in stress. They don't come to church. They stay away from church and they stay away from the church family. And you know what? Instead of getting better, they usually get worse. We're here to help. I need you. You need me. We need each other. Amen. Amen. Together we can do it. Yes. Apart we can't. Amen. So then we have the first, we have these, we've gotten to the place now. We've got our first plank. Our spirit's been changed. We now have the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. We begin to take control of our soul. And now we understand that the anguish of our soul, the mourning of our soul, all the conflict in our soul can be solved by the comforter with the Holy Spirit. And you know, one of the things also, we, we, get, we get this great resource of the Holy Spirit. But you know what the Holy Spirit mostly uses to help us? The Word of God. The Word of God. The Holy Spirit is, 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 is in the Word of God and through the Word of God. So, you know, the more words you get in you, the more Bible. That's why I hope, you know, some of us started reading the Bible through the year. Now, some of you are probably saying, oh, Pastor, I'm way behind and I forgot. You know what? The great thing about God, just start today. Amen. Just start today. Amen. Read four chapters today, three chapters on the, four chapters on the weekends, three chapters on the weekday. You'll be through the Bible in a year. I don't care if it's a calendar year or a year from now. Get the word in your life. Amen. How many you ate yesterday? Yeah. See, a lot of us, and if I asked you every individual thing you ate, you probably couldn't tell me, but you know you ate because if you didn't eat, some of you would be like, oh my gosh, I'm dying. The Word of God is like that. See, we, you, may read, you, you may read something and an hour later you say, what did I read? Your, 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 your human mind doesn't know, but your spirit knows, you see. That's why many of us have had this experience. We'll be in a situation, the Holy Spirit will, just a scripture will go bleh, right out of your mouth and you don't even know where that came from. Well, it came from the fact that you read the word and it's in there, amen? If you go to the bank and you try to withdraw $1,000 and you don't have $1,000 in there, guess what? You're not getting $1,000. If you don't have the word of God in you, sometimes we get in a difficult situation. The Holy Spirit wants to help us. He's got nothing to work with, amen? So we need to get into the word of God. We need to realize that. But this last one, we're going from our spirit to our soul to our body. And it says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now this meekness, is a, this third attitude is teaching us that our new spirit, which is now connected with the Holy Spirit, follow me, will take control of our soul, our intellect, our personality, and our emotions. And that will take control of our body, our physical and needs and desires. You see... Some of us are controlled by our bodies. Right. We're controlled by our desire for food, our desire for sex, our desire for stimulation, our desire, uh, you know, we get tired and our desire to be lazy and our desire to do what we want to do and our desire to raise a fist at somebody, our desire to give somebody the look. Right. See, we're controlled. We let our body control us and then, uh, you know, that affects our soul and that affects our spirit. But see, now that we're building this foundation, we got the spirit is in control of the soul. And the soul is now in control of the body. So we're not doing what feels good. That's right. Amen? I had a guy in my study years ago. He sat down and he said, Pastor, I just want to tell you, I'm leaving my wife. I said, oh, why are you leaving? I said, well, you know, there's, there's this young girl I met at work. And I know, I know she's 15 years younger than me. But you know what? I just... I just fell in love with her and I can't help myself. And I felt like going, slap! I'm sorry, I just couldn't help myself. God gives us the greatest gift of all creation, the will. And I know some of our wills 
are, are, are been, been diminished by the stuff we've done and by the repeated failures we have. But you know what? All it takes is a spark of will to change. And you have to use that spark of will. You have to say no. No to the flesh. And we're going to talk about that in, in a little bit. This idea of meekness revolves around two principles which are both outwardly that it comes from the inward but affects the outward. First one is repentance. How many know repentance involves outward action? Yeah. Repentance means to be going in one direction and turn around and go in the other direction. Right. It doesn't mean, well, I'm going to give this up. I'm going to stop. Oh, yeah, I'm going to the store. I'm going to get me some more booze. I'm going to get me some more drugs. I'm going to you know, still live with this woman. I'm still going to go out with this guy. See, that's not repentance, just thinking about it. Repentance is, you know what, I'm headed to the wrong place, I'm going to turn around and go the other way. See, that's repentance. That's a physical action that requires us to do something bodily. And of course, the other thing, repentance is connected with his forgiveness. Those two things are so important. You see, forgiveness also involves action. Amen? Amen? If I tell somebody I forgive them, and then I don't have anything to do with them, or I, I, I show bitterness to them, or anger toward them, or I speak badly of them. You know, when we forgive somebody, and then somebody says, well, you know, how are you and so-and-so getting along? Oh, yeah, well, you know, I forgave him, but, you know, he's still a jerk. <laughs> That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is, yeah, you know, jo you know Susie and I, you know, we're, 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 we had a, an argument, and, uh, you know, I asked her to, uh, she's asked me to forgive, and I forgive her, and, and you know, she, she's working on her life, and, and, and she's a good person. See, that's forgiveness. See, forgiveness involves our body. Involves what we do. Now, put, Paul puts this all together in Galatians chapter, uh, 5, Galatians chapter 5. And I got it up on the screen. And it's, it's a long verse, but I, this, is, this is it. Everybody say, this is it. This is what we've been talking about. This is the foundation. Church, we need to get this in our lives. And then we can build upon and do the great work that God has called us to do. If we don't, we're going to be off balance and we're going to be tilted. And the world doesn't need any more off balance, tilted people. Amen? So follow along with me. Paul writes, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That sounds pretty simple. You know, one thing I had to learn when I was in the world, I worked very hard at sin. Sin requires work. You know, for me, I was, had to lie and I had to, to, to play games with people and I had to, you know, manipulate myself and manipulate others and, you know, I had to, to tell stories and, and whisper sweet nothings in people's ears and everything like that. And, you know, and you got to keep with all, all the different stories and you got to remember who you said this to and then, you know, if you make this person mad, you can't go back. I mean, it's, it's, it's I mean, sin is, is work, amen? Yeah, it is. Especially when you live in that sin. But he, now he's saying, if you use that same effort you put to sin, you know, some of you put a lot of effort into sin. You know, some of you have had to manipulate and, and, and eat. some of us even had to steal and, 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 and do things that were illegal. And some of us had to, you know, run away and hide. I mean, we put a lot of work. If you, he's saying if you take that same effort you put into sin and you put it into walking with the Spirit, you'll be successful. Amen? But see, we want to go from all this hard work into sin and just think God's going to go dink and it's all going to be better. But God says, work out. Yeah. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. Yeah. Lift the Bible daily. Amen. Do some Bible calisthenics. Amen. Yeah. Do some knee calisthenics. Yeah. Amen. When you come to church, you know, let, let the praise come out. Amen. Yeah. Even if it's this, if this is as excited as you get, then go ahead and do it. Amen. <laughs> some of you are on the verge of a heart attack right now. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the spirit, there's that little s and that big s working together, you are not under the law. That's right. Amen. For now the works of the spirit are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. Oh, I would never do that, Pastor. You know, that's perverted stuff. I would never be involved in that. Oh, yeah, how about the next ones? Hatred. How many of you hold hate in your heart? I'm meddling now, huh? Hate. 
contentions. How many of you contend with other people? Always arguing, always want to get the last word in. Always, you know, you just can never let something go. Jealousies. How many are jealous? Jealous of a loved one or, or jealous that, that Johnny got the promotion and you didn't or jealous that the Joneses got a bigger TV than you. Outburst of wrath. How many let anger control our lives? How many, how many, how many of us say things that we shouldn't say? How many, how many, how many, how many, how many, how many, including myself, do? selfish ambitions. This is right along with adultery and fornication. This is right up there. How many of us have selfish ambitions? It's, what did we learn at the art of marriage? The core to every human being is selfishness. We are by nature selfish because we have a sin nature. That's the battle in marriage. That's the battle in every relationship. I want my way now. If the world would just do what I say, everything would be fine. Amen? Dissensions. You know, we, we, we have dissensions. We, we you know, argue with. That's why, I, you know, the, 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 this, the, all these things, hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, is all what reality TV is about. People want to see people get mad at each other. People want to see people act jealously and stupid. Amen? I don't know why. They don't, they don't need TV for that. Just look around. Heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, all of which I tell you before, and just as I told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Practice. Practice. You know, Jared was up here playing the piano today. You know how he got to the point he's at now? He practiced. Right. He just didn't get up this morning and say, hey, mom, I'd like to play the piano during church today. See, none of us, to practice sin means we work at it. That's right. Amen. We look for it. We try to find it. We seek it out. You see, when you become a Christian, you shouldn't practice sin anymore. You should hate it. You should forsake it. Yet, do we sin? Absolutely we sin. That's right. But when we sin, we repent of it. And repent means what? Not just thinking about doing something, but turning around and go the way. The Bible said if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Some of you need to cut some things off. That's right. If you can't control what you watch on the internet, then don't, don't get on the internet without your, somebody in accountability with you. Or put, put it in a play. Or, or get rid of it altogether. That's right. Apostle Ron Jr., I don't know how many know he is, is a, one of our pastors in our, in our denomination. Uh, he, he, he could not control himself when he would go to a motel from, from renting the, the porno movies. So when he would go check in the motel, he would ask them to take the TV out of his room. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. That's right. If you can't hang out with so-and-so and not let that person suck you back into the world, start talking about worldly things and start getting your mind all screwed up, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Yes. Do, what, do what you can because you know what? Your goal is heaven. Amen. Amen. Paul goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against there is no law. And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with his passion and desire. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now, this last foundational block has a great elevation, has a great altitude. It says... Meek will inherit the earth. Now, it doesn't say the meek will inherit the kingdom of the earth. The kingdom of the earth belongs to who right now? Satan. Satan owns the earth because we gave it to him. And that's why Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We're now, the kingdom of God now is invading the kingdom of the earth, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the world. We are, we are ambassadors sent to a foreign country. Yeah. Amen. But we're not going to inherit the kingdom of the earth. We're going to inherit the earth. Yes. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's look at it. Revelation chapter 21, 1 through 8. This is our inheritance. Amen. This is a great, this is what we're working for. This is what we're shooting for. Yeah. This is where we're going to be, amen. This is where I'm going to be someday, amen. Now, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. See, we're not going to inherit this old earth. Yeah, that's right. There's a new earth coming. Yeah. There's a new heaven coming. Glory. 
God has made it just for us. Amen. Isn't he a great God? See, he made the first earth for us. And he put us in the Garden of Eden. And guess what? We blew it. Oh, pastor, if I was in the Garden of Eden, I would have never eaten the fruit. Ah. You eat the fruit every day. You rebel against God every day. You do what you want every day. That's the sin nature that we fight against. You'd ate the fruit. And the, and the guys are saying, well, I would have I would have stood up for my wife. Eh. Guys, we do it every day. Our wives say, jump off a pier. We say, which pier? Amen? <laughs> Just kidding. But we all have that sin nature. That's why God put them in the garden, to show them you can't do it on your own. You need a Savior. You need a Christ. Amen? Amen. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. See, God is with us now in spirit. He lives within us. But when we get into the new earth, into the new Jerusalem, Jesus is going to be right there. Jesus is going to be ruling right there. We will see Jesus. We will behold him. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory. The one who is with the nail prints in his hands and the, the nail prints in his feet and the wound in his side. He'll be there. We'll see him face to face. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. There shall be no more death. No more death. No more separation. No more that emptiness that comes from losing somebody or something or, 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 or that whole idea of, of, of emptiness. No more death. No more sorrow. No more crying. There'll be no more pain. Amen. Yeah. Glory. Amen. Amen. This earth is connected to pain and sin yeah. and death. Amen. There'll be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then he sat on the throne and said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of life, who freely, water of, of life freely to him who thirst. He who comes shall inherit all things. We're going to inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And that means my, my children. Isn't that great? That's what, we're, that's what we're in this game for. That's where we're headed. If we, if we build our lives upon this foundation. There's a warning in verse 8. But the cowardly. Yeah. I never thought of that way. But you know, it takes, it takes courage to be a Christian. Yes, it, it takes courage to accept Christ. It takes, it takes courage. You have, to, you have to stand up and do something that's hard to do. You have to overcome. You see, right now, some of you, your flesh is fighting your spirit. Yeah, right. Because you don't have the strength yet. You haven't built in it. And you've let the flesh win for so long that, that you, what the, the devil tries to do is, is discourage you. That's right. And the Holy Spirit wants to encourage you. Make this change. Make the commitment. Stand up for Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. But, it, you know, people think, you know, Christians are weak and Christians, you know, are, 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 are superstitious and Christians are all that. But you know what? Christians are the most courageous people in the world. Amen. It takes courage to be a Christian. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars. You know why it says liars there? Who's the king of all liars? Amen. Satan. See, if Satan can get you to believe one of his lies, he can hook you for a long time. But the Bible says the truth, which Jesus is the truth, will set you free. Some of us, man, I used to just hear them lies all the time from Satan, and I bought into them. But the minute I broke the lie, my life began to change. Amen. When I said, I need help, I have a problem, I, I, I can't do this thing by myself. The minute I, I reached out to other people to help me, it began to break those lies that Satan had in my life. None of these shall have their part. All the liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire, the brimstone which is the second death. You know, the Leaning Tower of Pisa was about to fall over. 
about, uh, I think it's probably now, but about 75, 80 years ago. They had cleared all the, they evacuated all the apartment complexes. They put a big uh, chain link fence around it because they thought it was going to fall because it was, foundation was getting worse and it was leaning worse and it was, and, and they just, any minute. So they got together all these scientists and everything and they, they, they came up with a plan to fix the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And what they did is to prevent the collapse of the tower was to straighten it up a little bit, to stop it from leaning, but to straighten it up and to also take the soft soil from out underneath that side and put hard, compacted soil in. So what they did is they straightened it up and they restored the foundation. I want the praise team to come up as we get ready to close. Some of us today need to straighten up Amen. and to shore up our foundation. Yes, we do. God's got a great call on your life. Everybody here, Amen. I don't care if you're, you're a child, a teenager, an adult, senior adult, God's got a call on your life. Amen. God wants to use you to do great things Amen. because it, it, that's why God put you here on this earth. You're here for a reason. But God can't use us if we're crooked. Amen? God can't use us if our foundation is weak. Because all it's going to do is, you know, when people look at our lives, if what we say doesn't match what we do, then it doesn't work. It causes their life to go tilt. So we need to shore up our foundation. We need to straighten up. We're going to sing a closing song called Draw Me Close to You. James 4, 7, and 8 says this. Therefore, submit to God. Amen. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now, we're going to sing this song, and we're not going to... This is, this is the closing. When we start singing the song, if you're done, you've got everything you need today, have a nice day. God bless you. I hope we see you tonight. Because we're going to sing this song, we're going to leave it open for, for people to come and let the Holy Spirit move in them. Because you know what? I can't pray this for you. I can't do this for you. You need to draw close to God. Amen. You need to resist the devil. Amen. And some of that is you need, to, you need to get out of your seat and you need to come down here and you need to kneel and pray or stand and pray. You need to, you need to make a commitment today. Amen. And you need to write it on a piece of paper that said on March 10th, 2013, I am going to straighten up